first uh, welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to invite Markus Müller, who recently obtained his PhD from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. That's a great achievement. Uh, he did that uh, publishing this very nice uh, uh, document on multilingual modulation by neural language codes, which he will now explain to us in more detail. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, hello, welcome also from, from my side. Today I would like, to, would like to talk about a little bit of the research that I've done as part of my PhD thesis. And Christian has already said it, it's about multilingual modulation by neural language codes. And what this exactly means, I'm going to talk about within the next couple of minutes. So let's start off with a short overview about the outline of my talk. Um, first of all, if you're interested in more detail about this stuff, it's all based on a paper that was recently published, I think a week ago, on the Interspeech in India, um, where we were able to publish this as a paper. So regarding the talk, I would first like to start with a short introduction into the topic, what is the problem that we are trying to address here. Um, then I would like to talk about how I address this problem, namely I uh, looked at how can we encode language information using something that I call language codes. And then I'll talk about how I integrated those codes into the neural network architecture. Um, based on this, we then did some other things, how we can include additional knowledge into our system. So here, we mainly focused on using uh, CTC-based systems trained directly on characters. So there you typically don't have any additional sources of information. And one of the things that I tried was to include additional sources that we already know. So we know there are things like phonemes and can we maybe use them as part of our network training to further improve the performance. This also then led to the point where we built a giant network superstructure based on multiple networks that were combined and then jointly trained together. Um, in the notion of MetaPy networks, I explain this uh, in more detail later. Um, pretty old approach, uh, like 20, 29 years ago, so from 1990. Um, where they were first published, but again, it still helps. Um, and I will, of course, end with a conclusion. So multi, uh, speech recognition in general, I guess you all know, it's a very costly AI problem because there are many languages in the world and the best way to build a system for one particular language is to just train it on this one single language, which also means we have to train one system for each language, and that's pretty... Um, expensive problems if you don't want to cover just uh, a few of the big languages, but maybe potentially all languages in the world. But what general approaches are there to build such a system? Well, of course, you can start doing it cross-lingually. So you train a, a system on language X and try to use it, for instance, on English. Performance will be terrible. So this is why no one uh, will, does it, uh, will, will, will do it. Another approach would be to build a multilingual system. So you include data from multiple languages, train your system on this, um, and then you get kind of a mediocre performance somewhere in between. But again, the best system performance you, of course, get when you actually train on your target language. Um, so English on English, of course, yields to the best performance. The monolingual setup um, always wins. Um, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I ask questions now? Yeah, sure. So in the first example, you're talking about where you have audio in, say, Filipino and an English transcript. Uh, no, I'm talking about having audio in Filipino. I'm trying to recognize Filipino outputting a Filipino transcript, but I only have an system trained for oh, English. Okay. Oh. So that's the okay. most terrible situation you're going to okay. have. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, number two is all languages in one. What's the, what's the number? What's so it means an English language model or an English recognition system and multiple input languages, one of which might be English when you recognize it fine, and the rest will be mismatched, like okay. mostly yeah. in very bad translation. Yeah, so in, in our case, this would be a system trained on German, English, French, Turkish, and we try to recognize English. This, of course, results in a mediocre performance um, because that's one of the problems that we're trying to address. 
So when people typically train multilingual systems, they start by training it on multiple languages, but then in the end they typically fine-tune it on one particular target language, and they get quite good results when they do this. So typically such a system has, depending on the amount of data you have, better performance than a monolingual one, but only just on this one target language where you fine-tuned it on. And on the other perf uh, languages, the performance will degrade. So what do we really want? Well, we want to have a quick adaptation to languages, so that no matter what the input language is, as long as we have seen it during training, uh, we do achieve monolingual performance um, on this particular language. So multilingual ASR, of course, is a little bit difficult. Um, one of the problems is that when you train on multiple languages, you introduce additional ambiguity. And if you go, let's say, for instance, have a look at the, um, the um, position of the tongue when you're speaking, um, then you have certain uh, phones that you can utter, um, but typically you don't utter these phones in isolation. So you speak one phone before, one phone after it. So typically when you uh, want to say, let's say, an O, um, your tongue moves towards this, and then again afterwards moves against another um, target. So you probably don't see this canonical O as it would be uttered in isolation. So this, of course, adds some additional ambiguity. And if you do this for multiple languages, you get some shifts here. And you don't really see um, those uh, targets being uh, hit um, right on spot. That's also something you see when you train a monolingual system. Um, but the problem is much worse when you're training it on multiple languages. So the question is, what can you do? Well, in the best case model, when you want to train um, a multilingual model jointly on multiple languages, the best case you're going to have is uh, you have all your data um, annotated using IPA, so a common set of symbols. So each symbol in each language represents the same sound. But of course, you see those sounds in language-specific contexts. So this is just what I pointed out, that you have some additional ambiguity here. So our idea, therefore, was to invent an adaptation method uh, where we could use some language features to adapt the neural networks. And our approach was to uh, use language codes. You can also think of them as language embeddings which were extracted via an ancillary neural network, which was trained on an auxiliary task. And based on these codes, um, we were able to stimulate our networks to learn features um, depending on those extracted language properties, and we, which would improve the performance. Furthermore, we also optimized our neural network architecture and the way, and the way how we integrated those language codes into our system architecture. And doing this, we were able to achieve and exceed parity with our monolingual baseline um, due to the instant adaptation to languages thanks to those um, language codes that we would provide to our system. So how do those language codes look like? So at the beginning, we started with a very simple approach, just having uh, a simple bit vector, one dimension, represents one particular language. We added this to the acoustic features to the network, and we saw some gains from this. But at the same time, those arbitrary features, they do not represent some language properties. So we wanted to have a richer representation of those language features. And one way to do this was to use language feature vectors. And in order to extract these, we simply trained a feedforward neural network on the task of language identification. And this network had a second to last layer, a very narrow layer, um, which we would then use after training to extract our language feature representations. And these features, they are uh, richer than simply the language identity alone. So how did we extract those in the end? Well, first of all, we have to account for the language information being longer term in nature than you say when you would do a typical phone identification task. So for this, we at first used a rather, a rather large context window of uh, roughly 700 milliseconds to extract these language codes. And in addition, we smoothed the outputs of this network. 
So on an utterance basis, we averaged those extracted features from this network to have one language representation per utterance. While this makes it difficult for online scenarios, because yeah, you can't wait for the utterance to finish because you directly want to start recognizing things, um, it's also possible to extract this on a speaker level beforehand. So if you have some data from the speaker before, um, you can also extract those language features and it will work similarly well. So this is something that we already introduced in 2006, uh, 2016 sorry, um, on the interspeech. Um, where we would first append those features to the acoustic features of our system, and we saw some gains from that. So be, before I move on, I would like to have a closer look at those language features. So what are they? And one of the things that is always interesting to see is when we extract those features and project those features down uh, using TSNE to a two-dimensional plane, um, how does the structure of the data look like? So in this case, you see some um, example feature vectors, and I call it them by language identity. So here we see different clusters for the different languages that we were extracting. So we can clearly see those clusters are um, separated by each other, and there is a little bit of uh, variance within each cluster. To train this network, I used data from nine different languages that were part of the data set that I was using. There was one additional language in the data set, and that lang language was English. I did not train on English, but nevertheless, you can see here that um, this cluster here of, of English was extracted by the network, representing English features, even though the network has not seen English during training. So here you can see that this network is able to extract language properties even from an unseen language. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, so those actually should be two different shades of blue. So this should be a different shade of blue than, 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 than this one. I'm sorry if this is not really uh, visible here, but those two shades should be, should be different. Um, so this was the one indication that we have that we really are extracting language features here. Wait, so the, that, that cluster that you're pointing to, you trained on a bunch of different languages, and then you yep. ran that network with English utterances, and, and it produced those embeddings. Exactly. I see. Okay. So this language was not seen during training, only uh, during inference I used data from another language. What is the size of that uh, feature vector? Um, uh, 42 dimensions. 42, and you add that, after that, you add it to the, each frame in the, in the Exactly. And in one scenario, I also talk later about how we optimize the way how we can adapt this to the, to the network. So another thing that we really wanted to make sure that we are extracting something that is related to language and not maybe some other artifacts that are specific to data from one certain language. So here we all use data from the Euronews TV broadcast news station. Uh, which should be identical with respect to the acoustics, and the only difference should be the language. But to make really sure, we also recorded a data set ourselves in our lab. So I actually asked, asked a colleague in our lab to read out some English sentences, and he had a rather strong German accent, so this was really putting it to the test. And in order to um, see whether or not um, we would extract language features, we tried to detect the language based on those uh, language features. So initially, we created some language prototype vectors uh, where we would simply extract those LFVs for all the languages in our training, average them per language to have some um, prototype vector for each language. Then we also extracted those LFVs for our test speaker, and then we computed the Euclidean distance between those two uh, feature vectors. And here you can clearly see that those features represent um, English features for, our, for the data from our test speaker. And on a side note, the distance to German is the second lowest. So um, you could see that it may also have guessed that this speaker is not a native speaker because he was speaking with a strong accent. But at the same time, we also get a rather close proximity to, let's say, Italian uh, and Arabic. And I don't know if his speech has also some features <laughs> from, from there embedded in there. Like recording an actual native English speaker and see if that distance is lower? 
Um, we yes, we we did that, and the distance was a little bit a little bit lower than 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 this. So yeah, this was also some control experiment uh, where we would uh, record someone who is who is native speaker here. Um, okay, so the big question is: Have we found the hidden code of length? Yeah. Can you go two slides back? This one. No, the yeah. yeah. Uh, that uh, bottleneck you added before the last layer. What yeah. is the impact of that on the language identification task itself? Like you are training that for a language identification task to use it later, but uh, yeah. did you measure the impact of that bottleneck? Did the accuracy of the language identification mm -hmm. task degraded by adding that? Ah, um, it degraded a little bit. Better. Not 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 much, but a little bit. So in general, I think we have like 17% um, frame error uh, when detecting the languages. And I think when adding this bottleneck, it was like 16.5%. Uh, so it, of course, had a little bit of, of effect introducing this bottleneck to the task at hand. Um, but it was not really dramatic. And what so is the ratio between the original vector and the bottleneck? The bottleneck is 42 and the original one um, let's see, we have a window of, so we have 33 frames. Each frame has a dimensionality of 52. So I think we have, uh, yeah, something, something along those lines. Yeah. Okay, so how did we apply those codes to our network? Okay. So we used two different architectures, so at the beginning, we simply added those language codes to the acoustic features that we would input into our network, just like you would do it for vectors for speaker adaptation. But then another idea that we had is that those language features, they are not as signal related as speaker or channel properties. So maybe it would make sense to integrate them deeper into the network architecture and not simply add it at the input layer, but maybe somewhere deeper inside this architecture. And this is what we did here where we would um, add them in the middle of the network using a method uh, we call modulation, where we would multiply um, the output of this uh, block based on those language codes. And how do you have to uh, imagine how that works? Uh, well, let's look back in time. 1992, there was this great paper, MetaPy. Um, how can you build a system uh, using uh, distributed knowledge. Um, and one thing that this paper introduced was the use of those MetaPy units. And they virtually allowed to um, multiply the output of a network, to modulate the output of a network uh, with an external coefficient in order to combine then the outputs of multiple network to the final output. And this was one idea that we used here. So in fact, um, we were taking the outputs of each neuron of the network, would multiply it as in modulate it with a an coefficient, and then would output OI prime, would forward this to the next layer. So by doing this, we would this actually. Element wise multiplication? That's, uh, yeah. So we have to have the same number of coefficients as we have outputs in our network. So in order to ensure this, we make sh made sure that we have a multiple of those 42 units in our network, and then we would simply stack multiple uh, of those language codes together to really um, have one coefficient ready for each output of the network. So by, by doing this, the outputs of individual neurons would be emphasized or attenuated based on those language properties. And this, in a way, forces the, the units to learn features depending on language codes. And also, by supplying different language codes, we would adapt the inner structure of our network based on those language properties. So when we have a, a new language, we would input another language code, and this would reconfigure the network by applying different weights to the internal connections. So it's, in a way, um, similar to, to dropout training, but instead of omitting those connections on a random basis. We would simply um, yeah, modulate them in an intelligent manner by um, attenuating or emphasizing the outputs of certain neurons, certain parts of the network. 
and this actually helped more. So a little bit about our experimental setup that we used here. So I have already said it's a CTC-based system. Um, we trained it on four different languages. Uh, so English, French, German, and Turkish. We had about 45 hours of data per language available. Um, as input features, we used some multilingual bottleneck features um, that were extracted using a um, bottleneck network. We did not use any pronunciation dictionaries. Um, and as evaluation metrics, we had the character error rate, as it is typical for those uh, type of systems, and of course also the, the word error rate. So when we compare the different adaptation methods, um, and here we have the character error rates for each language in our training and test set. So when we don't apply any uh, adaptation, then we get the highest error rates for each language and an, an average. When we would add our language feature vectors at the same level as we would do it for the acoustic features, then we see some improvements here. Um, but if we apply them in this multiplicative manner using modulation, we of course would decrease the word error rate even more. And this work was um, introduced earlier this year on the, on the ICASP, where we had a paper about this. So you're predicting characters. I'm predicting characters. Or a sequence of characters. Yeah, sequence of, of characters. And then you somehow decode those into words just using the language model or um, so those results aren't without a language oh, model. Character, right? Yeah. Later on, I also have some results with this uh, language model. Okay, so using those codes, we can actually train networks to be aware of those language features that we have by applying those weights to those connections. Um, and we can also um, use it to explicitly model some feature detectors that we would see fit for the task at hand. So the next idea was, can we also include phonetic knowledge into the network? Um, so can we use some pronunciation dictionaries in this architecture that would normally be trained only on, on characters? So one idea here was to pre-train a part of the network using uh, phone sequences for detection, and then pre-train another part for taking the outputs of those uh, features that the first part would produce and map them to characters and then jointly train the network together. So for this, um, we started by using the same architecture that we had before and would first train it uh, on phonemes as targets. Then we would freeze those two layers at a third block and would only train the third block, this time using characters as output. So this time, this block would be forced to learn a mapping between the features extracted by these blocks, which were pre-trained using those phonemes, um, and then to produce the, the character outputs. And then in the third step, we would allow updates in all three blocks, um, which then again refined all the features in the network jointly. Um, this was some work that we uh, presented earlier this year on a, a German conference for uh, speech recognition, and this actually lowered the um, word error rates. So this here in this setup was our baseline, uh, the number that we had before. Um, when we would apply this training method by including phonetic knowledge, the uh, error rate, the character error rates would drop. Um, so you can see in, uh, improvements throughout the different languages. As a contrastive experiment, we would simply add more layers without including some phonetic knowledge. And there you can see the error rate increases, um, probably due to some, some overfitting uh, problems here. And here we also evaluated this uh, using a basic RNN-based language model um, that was trained on characters. And there you can also see that the improvements that we observed as in character error rate also translate to improvements in, in word error rate. Did yeah. you also have results for pre-training four layers? Did they improve? Um, they were... Well, it's, it's difficult to compare because pre-training with uh, phonemes on four layers would, of course, have a lower, a lower would result in a lower phoneme error rate than pre-training it with uh, characters. So it's not 
I th I'm not sure if I get your question correctly, but I think it's not a fair comparison yes. to, to compare tra networks trained on, on phonemes with networks trained on characters. But in general, of course, we see lower error rates when we train on, on phonemes, uh, which is something you would expect here because you don't have to uh, learn a any pronunciation rules in addition. Okay, so what do we learn from this? Well, get back to MetaPy. Because since pre-training helps, another aspect that MetaPy introduced was to have here um, um, yeah, source-dependent modules. So back in the days, they attempted to train a speaker-independent system where they would train individual networks on data from, from in individual speakers. And here in our case, we would train individual networks on individual languages of our architecture. So when we train smaller subnets on individual tasks, this really helps to guide the networks into the right direction and direct features and to, uh, to learn features which are relevant for us. So in our case, we would train smaller language-dependent subnets. We would then also look into ways how can we adapt those language feature vectors, which were again static for each utterance. So we would extract it first and then add the same feature vector um, at each time step. So here, when we also look into ways how can we extract such features in an adaptive manner, um, does that help? And then, of course, if we again jointly train this giant network superstructure, which is composed of individual subnetworks, um, this is something that, that really helps in um, improving the overall system performance. So this is how our final architecture looks like. So at the beginning, we added some pre-trained subnets. So we had small, smaller subnets trained individually on each language. So each network had about a fourth of the size of our main uh, network per layer. Um, then in addition, we had this network for extracting those adaptive um, language codes. Um, and we would first pre-train those networks, then add the main layers, uh, the layers of the main network, and then jointly train this entire architecture on all the data that we have. So one of, yeah? Do you add that multiplicative layer between any two layers or only after the first one? Like if you have multiple higher stems, do you add it between every one of them? Um, yes, so, so each part consists of, of two layers, and I added those codes after the second layer. After the so second in total layer. we had four layers. And I added those codes after the second between layer. Between each block has one of those. No, no, between no. layer two and layer three. Exactly. In so each block, separately. Like there's a different parameter, right? Um, I only have here these two big blocks. And I added wow. those, NL, those neural language codes mm -hmm. after the second layer of the first block. So in between those, those two blocks. I also evaluated adding it at different um, layers. but adding it right in the middle after the second layer resulted in the best uh, results. So other results were not as, as good, potentially because here um, the network should extract more basic features which are more or less language independent and then they should here be uh, modulated in a language adaptive manner to the final classification uh, part where um, the, the features are generated to really output the, the characters. So I also would like to talk a little, little, little bit about this small network here, where we would extract those adaptive um, language codes. So I've already told you, we stack those language codes to match the dimensionality of our layer. And we pre-train this by LSTM layer network on a very dull task for an uh, LSTM. So we would simply pre-train it to output those language codes in a stacked fashion. So it's a pretty easy task for this network, uh, which it picked it up uh, quite early. But in addition to our language codes, we would also input uh, our regular acoustic features. So when we would then jointly train our network architecture in general, this network is able to also adapt and to take um, also these acoustic features into account to further refine the extracted codes um, to improve the performance overall. 
The second advantage of doing this is that we actually break free of this uh, stacking that we did here, because this way your arbitrary segmenting uh, your, your layer, you're partitioning it um, based on those multiple uh, instances of the language codes that you're using. So you have then no longer this arbitrary grouping of uh, the outputs of the layer based on those stack of language codes um, if you allow free updates to this network, which we did. And to have a look at the results, so again here, this was our monolingual baseline, 25.3%. When we would use no adaptation of all, then we got a higher uh, word error rate. When we just used the modulation of the language codes in the middle, um, this error rate decreases, um, but we're still not on par with the monolingual baseline. Adding phonetic pre-training also helps a lot, but where we are really um, beating the monolingual baseline is by using our network superstructure, where we would pre-train this giant network architecture that is composed of multiple different networks uh, that are jointly trained together. And after we have done this initial run of experiments, we then also um, refined the, the uh, LS RNN based language model um, where we would um, optimize the number of uh, BioLSTM cells we had in this. And this again decreased the error rate, but still uh, you can see that we have an advantage here by using our multilingual network superstructure um, in contrast to the uh, monolingual baseline. So to conclude, I have shown you how you can adapt networks to multiple languages using language codes which are extracted by an ancillary neural network. Based on this method that we call modulation, we are able to stimulate the networks to actually learn features depending on language properties. Um, what also helps is if you pre-train parts of your network on different tasks that are beneficial um, for your global task that you want to do, and if you then jointly optimize those networks. Um, and the method itself, it's, it's rather general because you can also apply this to other domains than just for adaptation to, to languages. If you think of, for instance, something that is not, um, that has not the, the, these uh, sharp distinctions between languages, if you look into, let's say, accents or, or dialects, where you have a rather smooth transition between those different um, properties, then I think this method is also applicable in this domain. Um, and, of course, in the end, our hope is that if we are able to use more languages, then we still get better generalization across different languages and may then even look into looking into um, cross-lingual adaptation um, of our setup. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And again, here you have the, the main publication um, like it was uh, published last week on the uh, interspeech. Thank you very much. Did you do any look at, look at uh, multilingual sentences? Like, the best would be asked to have to Deutsch, I'll it, and then the second half of the sentence would be in English. Did you look at things like that to see how quickly it adapts to the change? Um, well, those instances we did not have in our training data, so we did not look into it in, in particular. I mean, what we looked into... Be a great use case, though. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I definitely agree. I mean, I looked at some hand-picked ex examples where, let's say, you had some, some German text yeah. with some uh, English words in it, like uh, certain places or so that, 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 that were named. And there it seemed to learn those specifics quicker, uh, but I did not do a really evaluation uh, of, of this because it was not really in our data that we had for, for and training. And the language model is, is language specific. So at the end, you wouldn't get this multilingual thing because you would then be uh, combining the, this multilingual acoustic model with a monolingual language model. Right. Well, it's only predicting letters, so it yeah, yeah. But trouble. at the end, and the later slides were predicting words, right? A combination. Of words. Uh, yeah. So for for for, for those uh, results, we were using uh, a language model. We it's a r rather basic one, so we only trained it 
on the training utterances that we had. So typically you train a language model on several millions of, of sentences. Uh, and here we had only like 150K uh, sentences. So it's a very, very basic. But since it's all in-domain data, I think it's still, still valid to, to do this. And of course, you can also adapt the language model using potentially this, this method here if you want to recognize uh, speech from multiple languages. So the setting you have is where you've got, you're combining like four low resource languages, right? Um, yeah. I'm wondering like, you know, um, did you ever consider uh, looking at a situation where you got like one or two, you know, like, like you might have like a lot of data in English or French or German or all three, but you don't have very much in Turkish, right? So then, then the problem becomes like, okay, given that I have a bunch of data in these other languages, but very little in Turkish, how well can I do in Turkish by doing a multilingual training? Did, did you ever try anything in that kind of setting where the, the amount is quite imbalanced? Uh, yeah, no, we did not try it in this part of, uh, ex of the ex experiments. Um, but I think it would be very interesting to, to see, especially um, how such a system would perform when you have one language which is very low resource right. and if you would then start to increase the amount of data you have in other languages. Right. So I think this is also some, some ongoing work that we're looking into into the, the future to, to see how quickly can we get a system to run in a, a new language where we don't have much data. What do you see as your next steps? I mean, what's that? You're done with your thesis and all that. What, what, are you, what are you doing? How are you going to use this now? What's your next step? Well, of course, one of the next steps is, of course, to try this with even more languages so that we can see, can we uh, yeah, adapt it? Uh, or do, do we see some generalization uh, when we add more languages? And the other thing, of course, is to integrate this, since it's um, just a CTC-based system, to integrate this idea into traditional systems. So, for instance, when we would do, use it in our lecture translator, where we would not have to select the input language anymore, where you can just start speaking, you have one single acoustic model, and whatever the input of your language speech is, it would output the appropriate um, output. So this is one of the things that we are also looking into. Um, of course, you could also do this with uh, just adding a language ID to your system and try to detect the language, but I think it's uh, much nicer if you just have one single uh, acoustic model and you don't have to run multiple instances of, of your workers uh, where you then select the one you want to use. Uh, one quick question that yeah. uh, for the slide before this one, the, the uh, and the R one before this one, uh, maybe it was ahead, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, well, there's the one where you had the, uh, it's, it's, it's ahead, uh, don't worry about it. The, what was the test data that you were using? You showed that the monolingual baseline and then you had the different steps and then you had uh, the combined model of the model. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the, what are you, what's the work calculated against? What's the test set? Um, okay, so we had these 45 hours of data, and we split those into 40 hours of training data and five hours of test data. Okay, and the five hours, is it uh, one individual? Is it across the population? Uh, what's, what are the characteristics of um, So I selected them on a speaker basis and just put random, divide okay. them randomly on, on a speaker basis. How many speakers? Um, I would say in total, we have like... Uh, it's, it's pretty much, uh, there, there are many speakers in there, so I would guess it would be in total something like 100 speakers, and, and then we divided it like... What are the characteristics of these speakers? So I, I, there's a reason I keep asking these questions. Uh, <laughs> what, what, um, it, is the population diverse, or is it pretty uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, homogeneous? Is it, is it all German speakers of English, or is it... You know, you have uh, the various accents and stuff like that. And the reason I'm asking that is if it is a diverse set, then partly what you're doing is you are, uh, because you have the other languages in there, you're supporting, supporting more diversity. That's the hypothesis that I'm yeah. trying to test here. Yeah. Okay, so the data is TV broadcast news, so it's mainly anchor speech. 
So okay. you typically have trained speakers, and I would think it's a more homogeneous uh, set of, of data, not only because of the speakers, but also because of the acoustics. So you always have some professional uh, line, uh, levels there, some professional okay. microphones, recording equipment, stuff like that. Variation across speakers, of course. Too. Yeah. It seems to me that your model will be more resilient to uh, speaker diversity than the, uh, a baseline model would be. I mean, the baseline model is going to be somewhat, it depends yeah. on the data that you train them, yeah. of course, but you're adding in features from other languages which are characteristics of what cause uh, accent differences yeah. in speakers of the language. Yeah. And if you're somehow representing, if that's mm -hmm. being represented, if that's actually, the network's actually learning that, mm -hmm. then you're uh, improving the robustness of the model by introducing uh, the, you know, variations of the acoustic representations of the phoneme sets across those different mm -hmm. languages. I could just make the model more robust, and so on. Um, yeah, that, that, that's also possible, but also with a focus on the different languages. Mm -hmm. So as a contrastive experiment, we also try to supply those language features using just the monolingual baseline, uh, and there we did not see uh, big, uh, any improvements at all. So that's, that's interesting to, to see. So this was also some of our um, yeah, contrastive experiments to make sure we're not building some sort of a hidden and very fancy uh, speaker adaptation yeah, right. here. Right. So I also tried it just on the monolingual data, and it had almost no effect. Did, yeah. did you try evaluating on, on other languages than English? Um, yes, so I evaluated it on all the four uh, languages uh, in the training and the test, but I only computed those word error rates for, for English. But when I look at the character error rates, then we could see a similar trend on all different uh, languages. And then follow up question, did you try adding in some additional very distant language, like Chinese, Japanese, Hindi? Um, no, but only because we did not have the data for okay. it available. But that's, of course, a very, very interesting uh, research question. Um, one of the things that I also make sure that I really uh, stick to this data set that we had of just these TV broadcast news, because then we would have different acoustic conditions across the different languages. Because if you just merge data sets from different sources, um, chances are high that you're only adapting to the acoustics of first or foremost to the acoustics and not to some other uh, language related differences. I think uh, uh, with Turkish following the same, uh, like uh, number they were getting here, Turkish is the same. Um, it should have dropped too, I remember. Uh, yeah, so it, it has to, the, same, the same trend, so I don't have those numbers ready for, for these experiments here. But if we look at, let's say, um, that one here, um, so we can also see that we have some results, uh, some improvements here, although for Turkish in particular now, uh, it's not so much difference from moving from ad uh, additive to multiplicative codes um, as it is for, for other languages here. Also a second well, like idea about if this model, for example, is, I am a, if I am a Turkish speaker speaking English, it should do better in English recognition for me. So that is a good test case. Yeah. If you have such data, would be should do better. What was that question? Like, if this model, if I should do better than English and speech. I'm accented with Turkish, oh, yeah, should do better yeah. with me. So, right. yeah. the test case on that would be yeah, yeah. a good showcase for that. Yeah, it would be a really good showcase. Yeah. Well, it would also it might be also be interesting to throw in to, to just do accents like or dialects because mm -hmm. like like we're doing building all these systems for different Arabics. If we could just build instead of throwing. If we could, if we could silo them, mm. and then then you keep the training data separate, and you you still have a language model. Mm. Yeah, I mean you need to do the same thing with the, on the language model side too. Yeah, yeah I, I, ideally. Yeah. Can I ask a very basic question? Not being a speech recognition guy, so when you're training the acoustic model. Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, how do you get the alignment between frames and characters? Um, so in a traditional uh, approach, you would train it um, yeah, to um, start with a very basic model and then do several iterations. But here, using CTC, it um, finds those alignments itself during the, the training. So then the, the, the loss function actually conditions the network uh, to find some sort of an alignment Um, between the acoustic frames and the and, and the characters. 
I guess I don't understand what is the labeling of the data. Like on when you're on frame twenty, mm -hmm. what is the what's the corresponding label? Um, it's not trained on a frame level basis, so okay. it's just trained that okay, this sequence of frames of mm -hmm. input frames should produce this sequence of, of output okay. frames. Okay. And the actual alignment um, does not really matter in this case. So at each time step, mm -hmm. it can produce a character or it can produce like decide to not to produce a character? Exactly. So it can either, either produce a character or a blank symbol. And the objective basically gives you the same sort of uh, um, objective value whether it produces like, like let's say it produces a T space space H or space space th it gets the same uh value yeah so but like because it otherwise you'd end up biased towards one you know it, exactly yeah. yeah no so they they all fall into to, to the same class the same bucket i'm not sure how that works on a frame by frame basis though because when you're doing the the you know frame number one you don't mm -hmm. know that it's that it's going to produce a t eventually Mm -hmm. So you don't know how to score the, the, like it produces nothing. You don't know whether to, what's the what's the backprop, error backprop at that point. Well, you get dinged because um, you, you then because then you never produce the T, right? Because then by the time you get to the H, you've lost. You've no, lost so everything, so, right? so let's say you have three frames, right? Like, and somewhere in these three frames, you have to produce a T, right? Like if you produce the T. On the first frame, you get a bonus, right? Great, you produce the T, and then if you produce another T, you'll get ding. But if you produce two spaces, you're, you're fine. Right. But now, if you insert the first one, you produce a blank, you haven't produced the T. So is that, what's the backdrop there, right? Like, is that, is that did, it, did it match the label or not? Maybe I just don't understand how this training works in this case. <laughs> or you're backpropagating the entire word at once, right? No, it's so character by character, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so it's time step, but well, it's frame by frame. It's not character by character. So you first have to um, compute the error for the entire sequence of frames. Right. So then you then, then you know, OK, is it actually reasonable to produce this, this blank or this T at which time step? OK. Um, and then you sum up over all possible outputs that you could produce, and this then okay. um, produces the, the, the loss. Oh, so you're, you're actually producing a distribution over characters. Yeah. And we only take then the highest output as our, OK, this is the output for this time step. So you're not doing like perturbi decoding using no. the language model or something? No, no, we don't do this. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank so you. Said, yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs>